Yeah, I would like to introduce to you Carto Go, which is a scheme that we are running since uh, 2009. Um, I prepared a little presentation. Ah, okay, here we go. It's already on. Perfect. So um, I would like to start first um, why we are doing this. Basically, we are doing this to save space. Car sharing saves space. Um, and uh, there's a study of the University of Wisconsin. They have found out that in a 5 million resident city, 400 million square feet would be used for parking structures, while 26 million feet would be used for universities. That means we are spending 15 times more space for dead metal than for the education of kids, which I think is very dangerous. And uh, so uh, we came up with a solution that helps save space, and uh, I would like to show you why. Please concentrate on those black cars. I, I'm, it might be a bit difficult, as you will see, but please concentrate on these black cars because they, at the end, um, are the problem. Because, as you can see, they are just standing around the whole day. They come in the morning, they park the whole day, they consume space, and they they're standing around. They are not used. Those little blue cars are the car sharing cars. They are used all the time. And the whole uh, philosophy is about sharing assets, sharing the same piece of metal several times so that not everybody has to bring their own piece of metal. So how are we doing this? Um, we have come up with a system which is very, very close to the known car clubs, as you might know. Here in the UK, we call them car clubs. In other parts of the world, they're called car sharing. So basically, it's about using cars that were provided by us um, and uh, you know our cars in contrast to car clubs are spread around the whole city they are everywhere they are parked wherever you can legally park a car so um, there are no fixed stations so as you don't know where the stations are or where the cars are right now you need to find them in order to find them we have little tools like apps or an internet website where you can find those cars identify them and as a member you then go to this car you get a little member card from us when you register and you will be able to open the car. So you, you, you get into the car, you have to identify yourself, and then you drive around. Um, you can drive wherever you want. You can drive as long as you want. You can drive spontaneously. You don't need to reserve the car. So we are very, very flexible. And flexibility is very important in today's world where things change so quickly. Um, so once you just decided to finish using this car, you don't need to tell us in advance when that is. You just do it as long as you want. You just park the car. And you can park it, as I said, at any legally possible spot, which is also very flexible and easy for you. And then you just finish the rental, and um, the car is ready for the next customer, and the whole circle starts from the beginning. Um, this is very simple. The customer um, pays for this kind of car rental per minute um, and doesn't have to worry about anything else. Even the parking cost would be taken over by us. So um, the whole, the, how do you bring this into the cities and how do you make it attractive? I think the most important thing is you have to make it simple. People want to have simple ways of using things. They don't want to be somehow you know, in a framework or whatever. They really want to be free and do whatever they want at this specific point of time. So any time is also very important. You know, this lady has a good chat. She doesn't want to stop it just because she has to return her car at 6 o'clock. So she wants to chat as long as she wants and then return the car. And the other thing is anywhere people want the cars where they are and not want to walk to the cars. So we are doing this in 17 cities uh, and three of them, and now I'm coming to the point uh, here, is uh, uh, we are running this with electric cars. Um, these are Amsterdam, San Diego and Stuttgart. So all together we have 900 electric cars on the road, each uh, 300 in each of these cities. And uh, I would like to focus a bit on our experience from Amsterdam. You can see from the statistics here that we have 300 cars. This is about 9% uh, of our of our all, uh, all of our fleet uh, are electric cars in Amsterdam. We have another 600, as I said, in other cities. In Amsterdam, we have a home area, we call it, of 80 square kilometers where those cars are based. You know, you can start the rental and finish the rental inside this home area. So it's a quite large area where those cars are spread over. Um, but it's big enough that we attracted so far 10,000 out of our uh, more than 200,000 members worldwide. Um, so... Um, I would like to come a bit on the economies, economies of, um, of uh, electric car sharing. Um, if you see on the left, this is a cost structure, part of the cost structure we, we would have for combustion engines. And as you can see, um, the vehicle price is a very big um, issue in this. And the vehicle price, as you all know, for electric vehicles, it's much higher than for combustion engine vehicles. Um, so we have a kind of challenge for our business case over here because people are not ready to pay much more for electric vehicles. They would you know, expect to pay the same price than for a combustion engine car. So another one is insurance. Insurance is basically don't know really a lot about electric car sharing. So um, they usually uh, give you a premium and would have you pay a bit more. Fuel, of course, is less. Electricity is cheaper than, than the oil we have today. 
uh, and then we have parking. So at the end, you will see that uh, in order to run this in a sustainable, economically sustainable way, we need to have a reduction uh, in terms of parking costs or other costs that help us to sustain this model. Um, so coming to Amsterdam, they have done a lot on this. Um, they provide free electric parking for any kind of vehicle, not only for ours, but for any vehicle. If you purchase an electric vehicle, you will get one charging pole from them. Um, so by this, they have quite a few by now. They want to have 1,000 by end of 2013. A bit about our um, experience from Amsterdam. We, had, we were talking about technology, um, except for the period that you mentioned, John, um, in, the, in the beginning of the 20th century. This is a very new technology. Uh, we are used to very refined kind of vehicles we are that have been refined for 125 years. Uh, but these are is a new technology, so we learn a lot about technology. Um, we still need a lot of standardization. It's very new, it's very chaotic still. We need standards so that people can conveniently use this technology. In Amsterdam, we have two kinds of charging poles, so they never know what how to use each of the charging poles. So things have to be very easy and convenient. But once people get used to, they get very excited about all this. You know, electric mobility is exciting. They, they like it. Um, it's, uh, once you have ever tried it, 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 it's lots of fun. So a bit of the effect uh, of on the mobility, and then I will be finished. Um, it's 39% uh, of our ca customers currently uh, drive less kilometers with their private cars. This is not only electric cars. This is overall our car sharing scheme. Um, but it has an effect on private car usage. Um, and another thing which I think is very important, that we, which is very combined with what we maybe hear next um, about the smartphones and, and about mo uh, communication, that people start thinking about mobility in terms of situations. You know, when you have a private car, you just uh, naturally sit in the car every morning because it's there. Yeah, you pay it anyway, and it's there, so you sit in the car. You have no question what else to do. If you don't have a car and if you use the whole transport system, you selectively use the things. So our customers, they don't use car to go all the time, as you can see only 13% of the cases. Most of the time they use public transport. This is a worldwide figure. In Europe it would be even 35% uh, of trips using public transport. So the real thing uh, that changes is the uh, is attitude towards mobility of uh, thinking in terms of you know, this is, a, this is a, a block where I always use my private car to coming to flexibility about mobility situations where I choose the right piece of mobility that I need right now. Thank you very much. Thank you. I, I'd like to immediately connect what you said with what we heard from John uh, earlier. And John, obviously this uh, concept ticks a couple of boxes uh, when you're talking about the um, post car system. It's deprivatized, it's electric, it's light. Um, and the, the question I'd have is, um, is this the kind of post car cities as a system for cities which uh, you imagine? Or are we possibly giving the car a second life which it doesn't deserve? A sec second life. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, it, I would have thought this is a very interesting innovation that might come to be part of a post, what I call a post-car socio-technical system. Uh, and I thought one thing you particularly emphasized, which was important, was the importance that it should be fun and fashionable. And it seems to me something that's going to re replace the car system, has a many characteristics, but it will have to be the latest thing so that the steel and petroleum car seems so 20th century or even 19th century. Uh, and so the 21st century will be kind of figured around a different set of social arrangements and technologies and pleasures. It should be pleasurable, and that's what you were partly capturing. Now, there is another um, question about the current success of car sharing, which very much relies on smart mobile phones. Car sharing as a strategy in itself has been, probably some argue, already created in the 70s, scaled in the 90s, but it's really hitting the ground now. And it's a question for, for Patrick, because uh, it is indeed the mobile, the smartphone, which uh, in the end was able to scale car sharing. Is that a correct assumption? Yes, I think it is, and I think it's quite quite interesting to look at what happens now with the uh, evolution of smartphones. What we really see is that telecom is becoming a horizontal rather than a vertical industry. It used to be that you called someone, it was a, an industry in itself, the telecom. 
now it becomes almost like a utility. It needs to be there in order to have many other um, ideas, innovation products on top of that. I think that's, that's true. That is one thing that is happening. Kent, would you like to uh, come in, given that you have been pioneering a particular spatially efficient vehicle, and also link that technology a bit to this idea of sharing? Well, I think the future really is sharing. We're looking at having a whole ecosystem of vehicles where you, you uh, including mass transit, uh, located in very walkable cities. So you minimize the need for mechanized mobility to begin with, and then you have the right vehicle at the right time in the right place. So it's more fun and more affordable and hopefully faster. And, and uh, <coughs> I think the currency that makes all of that happen is the data that you, uh, that's enabled by new communication technology. Now, the question I have to ask you, Reiner, uh, relates a bit to, um, I guess, the whole strategy behind car sharing when it comes to its relationship to companies that produce private vehicles. A recent study from Germany showed that after seven months of car sharing, car ownership dropped amongst those new users from 43 to 19 percent. When I speak to automobile manufacturers, they usually say, well, we like car sharing because you can already create sort of a consumer preference for the car that then will be eventually bought when people have the money for it. <laughs> um, if these figures are right, that doesn't sound particularly encouraging. How do you sell your system, your strategy, amongst the broader Daimler ecosphere? Well, basically, my thesis is uh, this, this drop of car ownership would have happened anyway. Uh, and that is, I think, exactly the point. Um, and um, we heard this um, today already that you shouldn't fight against the trend. You should go with the trend. And, uh, you know, car ownership in cities is already at less than 50 percent. Like in, in New York, it's, I think, 46 percent. In Tokyo, it's 48 percent. So people don't own cars anyway. So if you ask a manufacturer what to do now, I mean, we won't catch those 52% anyway. Um, they will never go into any of our point of sales. Why should I then fight for the 48 uh, and, and decreasing part of 48% um, together with uh, another, other, I don't know, 30 manufacturers? So we asked ourselves, so how can we put something on the street for the 52%? And how can we make what they use today all in all more attractive because I also want to emphasize I don't we don't want to uh, replace uh, mobility with cars go we just want to be a piece of the puzzle in the mobility system and uh, we have done lots of activities together with public transport companies to offer common offers uh, joint offers and um, you know at the end um, we think this trend is happening anyway uh, of course, there are some people in our company who we have lots of discussions with, but at the end, uh, the company is committed. This is supposed to be a business, and um, yeah, we are doing pretty fine, I think. Well, I think this is a good moment to move on to another technology that clearly has uh, made certain tr older transport modes obsolete. Uh, it's an old and new technology at the same time. It's the bicycle. Uh, that is, of course, having an incredible renaissance around the world. Uh, and it's becoming smart and electric as well. If I can invite uh, Frauke to give her um, presentation on smart e-bikes, please. Sure. Thank you. So just for one. 